We're glad that you're here with us this morning. The Church of Christ in Newport, Florida. If you're visiting with us, of course, you're our honored guest. We are so happy that you are here. Uh, if you missed Bible study, of course, you missed a wonderful study. Uh, Brother Jerry does such a fine job. And we're learning so much. We've come to the part of the worship service, though, that we're going to do basically uh, the same kind of thing. We are come to the portion now where we are going to study together. This study is going to come in the form of me presenting a lesson that is going to be strictly from the Word of God. I would challenge you that you would open your Bibles and that you would follow along with me to make sure that the things that I say are so. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to ask them after the service. And I will be very happy to discuss these with you. Anything that you might have, uh, there's no issue whatsoever. Please feel free. But the most important thing you can do right now is to open your Bibles with an open heart and an open mind. And let's study these things together. Solomon was the wisest man ever to walk the earth with the exception of Jesus Christ. And Solomon, at the end of 12 chapters, speaking of a frivolous lifestyle... Speaking of a, a lifestyle of such abundance, such gold, such jewels, such uh, idolatry, such uh, a, a living with various women and concubines and wives, that at the end of all these things, he said this. For well, this is the conclusion of the matter. That it is man's duty to serve God. It is, it is man's all, he says in verse 13, chapter 12 of the book of Ecclesiastes. To fear God and to keep his commandments, this is man's all. The lesson we're going to look at today is God, the object. God is the object. Now, we have all participated in worship up to this point. We prayed several times together. Who are we praying to? We've sung these songs together. Yes, we are reciprocating. We're singing one to another. We're teaching. But we understand also who we're singing to. Who is the object of our worship? When we just remembered our Lord's death that was tried, uh, we, we tried to emphasize the importance and the gravity. This isn't a flippant act. What was our object? Were we thinking of our Lord while we were engaging in? What about now? We, we are going to study together so that we can better learn how to uh, present the truth to others, so we can learn for ourselves and grow. God is the object of many things. We're going to look at that this, this morning. So please, again, try me. Make sure the things that I say are true. If you've got an outline, you'll see that we've outlined this, and there are several subjects we're going to look at. Number one, trust. God is the object of our trust. There were some Pharisees in the first century who had a problem with this. And we're going to look at that. And we're not going to actually look at the text, but I'm going to reference it in this lesson. And if you want to perhaps mark your Bibles to Luke 18, that's fine. Because that's what we're going to be discussing when we get to that point. Now, we don't trust in ourselves. When the invitation is offered at the end of this lesson, as it is every single lesson... We give you an opportunity to obey the gospel. We give you an opportunity to put your trust in God who gave the gospel. Mm -hmm. And we give you an opportunity to receive the benefits available through him as you meet his terms. Now when you are submitting to baptize, being baptized and you're buried with him in baptism, are you trusting in the one who's dipping you in water? You better not. Are you trusting in uh, yourself? Oh, look at me, I'm doing wonderful things. No, I don't think so. No more so than a dead man is buried into the ground and he, he gives himself any credit. But you are trusting in God. You're trusting in God to forgive you of your sins when you do what he tells you to do. God is the object of our trust, isn't he? In order for man to benefit from the blessings bestowed by God, man must trust God. Do you think in Genesis chapter 6 when God presented himself to Noah and he said that the end of all flesh has come upon me and 120 years shall his days be, he is going to destroy the world and he gave Noah some commandments. Do you think that Noah trusted in God? How do we know? Well, Genesis 6.22 says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's how we know. 
His action displayed his trust. God is the one that has promised these blessings. And God is the one that must be trusted in order to benefit from these blessings. In Exodus 12, 25, he says, And it shall come to pass that when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised. That's the promised land, isn't it? Land of Canaan. In Isaiah 1, 19, if you remember in verse 18, he says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. In verse 19, he says, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. Now, if you shall be willing and obedient to God, then he's going to give you the blessings he's promised. That's what he's saying. If you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse number 9. You don't have to turn, obviously, if you can read the screen. I know it's a little small. I apologize. But you can see that some words are capitalized, and I'm going to emphasize those for you. Now, in this stage, you have King Jehoshaphat, the king in Jerusalem, the king of Judah, and he is being surrounded by armies. He is in dire straits. And listen to what he says. He is praying to the Lord, and he says this. If when evil cometh upon us as the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry to thee in our affliction, then thou will hear and help. Now let me stop. He is quoting basically Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 8, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he had a monumental and magnificent prayer. And his prayer was to God that when Jerusalem, when this nation would become afflicted because of their own sins, if they would turn to the Lord, then he would hear and forgive. So Jehoshaphat is referencing that prayer and acknowledging it to God that he is in a, a situation that he is, he is in dire need. And it says, And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come out to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit, O God. Wilt thou not judge them? Listen to this. For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither knoweth we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. We have no might. We have no idea what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Three references speaking of humility and understanding of the powerlessness of man and the mighty power of God. Where was Jehoshaphat's trust in this prayer? I don't know a better example than this. His trust was in God. In Psalm chapter 128, beginning in verse number 1, it, it will show us, it will emphasize that there is a certain being who is the bestower of all blessings. And it's the same concept that James spoke of in James chapter 1, verse 17. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for they shall eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like all the plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children in peace upon Israel. Look at all the blessings bestowed by God upon the who now? The obedient. Who's the bestower of these blessings? Well, of course God is. God is the Bestower of the blessings. God is the promiser of these things. But God is also the one who prescribes how you can get the blessings. Now, God had never said, you know what, folks? Just come to me any way you want to. As long as you have a tender heart, as long as you're sincere, I'll accept whatever you offer. Anybody got that verse? We know better than that, don't we? God has said, you can come to me, but you're going to come to me this way, or you won't come to me at all. Now, Deuteronomy 4, verse 9, it says, Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things that thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart with all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. You know, in Numbers chapter 15, there is a command given by God that might seem kind of strange to us, but you know it might do well. If you ever see me walking around, you, you never know. I might have a blue tassel attached to my coat, too. 
And I could look upon it and it would remind me that I have to obey the Lord with all of my heart. It isn't bound, is it? That wasn't speaking to us, was it? But if we need something to remind us, that's one thing. And they had it. They were instructed to do so, to put this tassel upon them. That way they would look at it and they would remember, I have to serve the Lord my God with all of my heart. Deuteronomy 6, 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down and when thou raisest up. Let me, let me ask you a question. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves right now. Do you think of him like this? Do you teach him to your children like this? Why not? When you're with your friends and your family, what are you talking about? Does God and his word seldom come up? Or is it something that is constantly spoken about? You know, what a person talks about says a lot about what that person thinks about a lot, doesn't it? I'll, I always use that example... Brother Lee and I used to eat dinner, and Jada would eat dinner, and, and Eddie and, yeah. and Celeste and all would come at times. We would always eat dinner before Bible study on Wednesday night. Guess what we talked about? All the time. Isn't that wonderful? Do you know why now that we want to be here with those of like precious faith, that we want to be around folks? Are you blessed with a godly family? I am. And do you know how I enjoy being around godly folks and speaking about these kind of things? Isn't it wonderful? Are we teaching our children, what's that word? Diligently. Are you thinking about it when you get up in the morning? Are you thinking about it while you're eating, while you're sitting around? Are you thinking about it when you lie down? What are you thinking about? I'm going to tell you something. If your mind isn't meditating upon these things like that, it should be. Verse 17, ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. Chapter 11, verse 13, and it shall come to pass that ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments which I have commanded you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 22, for if you shall diligently keep these commandments which I command you to do them to love the Lord your God and to walk in his ways and to cleave unto him. Why do I put these about diligent keeping of his word under the topic of trust? Because if you really trust him, you're going to do what he tells you to do. You're not going to question him. You're not going to say, but Lord, what do sticks, what do staves and shoulders have to do with the Ark of the Covenant? What in the world does uh, the fire from the altar, Leviticus 16, 12, have to do with uh, burning incense? It has everything to do with it because God says it does. You're not going to question that. You're simply going to say, Speak, Lord, 1 Samuel 3, for thy servant heareth thee. And you're going to submit to these commands in the obedience of faith because you love him and you trust him. And you believe that he is going to bestow these blessings upon you as he said he would. Man cannot trust in himself if he wishes to please God. And here's that reference in Leviticus, excuse me, in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. We can't trust in ourselves. That this uh, Pharisee trusted in himself. He says, I tithe of everything that I own. I fast twice in a week. Look at me. Look at all that I do. And this poor publican who was a tax collector. Anybody here like tax collector? You like paying taxes? This was the way that it was looked at. Nobody really liked this guy. And you know what he did? He went to that temple and be merciful to me a sinner. Who had the right attitude in that? That's not saying that this is all you have to do to be saved. Be merciful to me a sinner. That's not what he's saying. These folks were already Jews anyway. He's simply speaking of the attitude. Who is that publican trusting in? Now, who's the Pharisee trusting in? It's a difference, isn't it? He must be fully convinced that God will deliver on his promise. Titus 1 and verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now, God promised eternal life to some folks. Is he able to deliver? Well, if you don't believe it, then why are you here? Notice where the trust is placed. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 11. In whom you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. Wherein you are also risen with him, listen to this, through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. Now when you submit to be baptized because God said to do it, where is your faith? In the operation or working of who now? God. That's simple, isn't it? 
Speaking of faith, who is the object of our faith? God. God is the object of our faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The American Standard says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. Verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you believe that God will reward you if you do what he told you to do? Isn't it sad to think that those folks were out all the land of Canaan and they were displaced of uh, the Amorites in Genesis 15 and verse 16 as was, uh, was spoken by the Lord. All of these folks who put their trust in these gods of wood and stone that speak not neither do they hear. Isn't that sad? You know that they're putting all their trust. What about the prophets at Mount Carmel? As Elijah went to battle against them, 1 Kings 18 and 19. And as they were there, they were, they were crying out to their gods. They cried out from the morning until the, the afternoon. And in so doing, sometimes they would get a knife and they would even cut themselves. They were so distraught. They were putting their trust in what? Nothing. A figment of their imagination. There are no other gods. There's only one God. Isn't it sad to see these folks put their trust in all these things that are vain? A certain man blasphemed the name of God in the camp of Israel. Leviticus 24 and verse 11. He was placed in a ward. He was locked up until the mind of the Lord might be showed them. Leviticus 24, 12 and 13. The mind of the Lord was showed them through the word of the Lord. In, uh, in, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. God told Eli regarding Phineas and Ophni, his favorite sons. These sons who were profane. That he would raise up a priest that would do, listen to this, according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. Now God's speaking to Eli and he says, Eli, I'm going to raise up a priest that's going to do what I want him to do. It's going to, he's going to do exactly what's in my mind and in my heart. But how? Did you catch that word? A faithful priest. That's how. The priest described as faithful. I submit to you that in order to do what is in the mind of God, you must submit faithfully to the commands of God that he has revealed for you. Notice this next slide. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You're welcome to turn there or follow in your outline. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. Speaking of the revelation of the truth, the New Testament to man. It is spoken of in these terms. Verse 9. The things that God hath prepared. Verse 10a. The things revealed by the Spirit. 10b, the deep things of God. Verse 11, the things only known by God. Verse 12a, the things received from the Spirit of God. Verse 12b, the things freely given to us of God. Verse 13, the things which the Holy Ghost teaches. All of these things are summed up in this phrase. Verse 16, the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. How? Through the revealed word. Now, do we have the mind of God revealed to man, or do we not? We do. Of course we do. No wonder his word is called, Romans 10, 8, the word of faith. Why am I saying all this? Why did I go back and look at Leviticus? Why did I go back and show you the mind of God as it pertains to the, 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 the subject of faith? Because if you're going to act by faith, you're going to act in accordance to God's word. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing the word. Faith displays our trust in God. Romans 16, 26. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for what reason, Paul? For the obedience of faith. Did the folks here believe the Lord? And how do we know? Luke 17. Luke chapter 17, the Lord is in a certain place and he sees ten lepers. And they cry out to him, Lord, if thou can, you could heal us. And he said, go and show thyselves unto the priests and give the same testimony which was commanded of Moses. Give the same offering that was commanded for the cleansing of the lepers. And it says this, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that, How do you know they believed him? How do you know that they have faith in Jesus? Listen to this. He told them to go, and it says, As they went. How do you know they believed? Because they did what he said to do. Isn't that simple? Oh, that's so simple. Luke 17, 13, 14. What better example is there than this? Out of the Lord's own mouth. In Matthew chapter 8, it says this. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant, li uh, my servant lieth home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. You ever wonder about this account? Listen to what he said. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to thy servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Why did he say that in this context? Why did he say that in this context if he did not understand the authority that Jesus had? Jesus, there is no doubt from your display of power that you have power over all things. You simply speak the word. You don't have to go to my house. I'm not worthy. Sit right here and just speak the word, and it's done. He understood the concept of authority because he commanded men also. And he understood that when Jesus spoke, it happened. That's why. Notice what the Lord said. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, have, I have not found so great faith. Where was this man's faith? In Jesus. Hebrews 11. Beginning in verse 24. How did Moses act by faith? By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. How did he do it by faith? Go back to Exodus chapter 4. Moses, go unto Pharaoh and do this. What did Moses do? He did bicker a little, didn't he? Well, I'm not a very eloquent speaker. Well, I can't do this. Then when he's out of excuses, what did he do? He went. By faith. What about this one? Who's the ob object of our love? Is it okay to love one another? To love our families, our friends? It's not only okay, it's it's an obligation, isn't it? We have to. What does love do? Does love pat you on the back while you're engaging in constant unrepentance sin? Have a good day. Good day, buddy. I love you. I accept you for as you are. Go on to hell. Is that what love does? Love does something else, doesn't it? We spoke about that in the James class this morning. James 5, 19 and 20. Brethren, if one of you do err from the truth and one of you convert him, let him know that that he that converts a sinner from death has hit a multitude of sins. He saved a soul from death. If we love one another, we're going to do our best to look out for one another. Now what happens if someone's engaging in sin? We have to go to them and try to correct them. Don't we? That's showing love, isn't it? If your son's going to reach out and, and he likes to go play in the road, what are you going to do? No, you can't do that. You're going to get a whipping if you do that because that, that car is going to hit you and it's going to kill you. You love this child, and so you're looking to his best interest. But God ultimately is the object of our love. God has to be loved above all others. Now notice that God loves man, 1 John 4. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here it is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, so, so we see that God loves man. And man should love God. God created us in such a way as that we could choose to love him. Think about this. Would it be more loving for a being... To create someone with free will so that they could choose to love him? Or would it be more loving to create uh, 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 someone that wasn't capable of doing anything else? This is where sin comes in. This is where consequence comes in. This is where all this comes in because God has given man a choice. And that choice is to choose to love him. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one Lord, that thou should love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Love the Lord thy God, teach the commandments, and keep them. We're going to display to you today that love for God is expressed a certain way. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, I love God? If you love Jesus, you buy the t-shirt, right? That's what everybody else does. If you love Jesus, you share the post on Facebook, right? That's what they say. But the Bible says if you love Jesus, you do what Jesus tells you to do. That's difficult sometimes, isn't it? That's difficult for some people. You know, there was a time where I, I said that, and I was like, you know what, I love God. And then I looked around for a second and said, nope, I sure don't, because I'm not obeying God. If I don't trust God enough to obey God, I don't love God. Listen to this. If there be a, a rise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder come to pass, whereof he spoke unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Why? This false prophet comes up and he tells you something and it actually comes to pass. God allows it to come to pass for a reason. To prove it. To see if you really love him or not. How is love expressed again? Look at the very next phrase. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. That's how love was displayed to God. If you really love God, you're not going to listen to this false prophet because God's already spoken. You remember 1 Kings 13? You know, that, that, that man of God, that's his name. He's not named. The man of God's all it says. man of God went to Jeroboam in Bethel and he cursed Jeroboam in that altar. And as he's coming back, he was told, don't you go back the way that you came. You go a different way and don't you eat or drink anything there. What's he do? He goes in there and Jeroboam offers to feed him. Nope. So then he goes off, and another guy comes to him and says, Hey, I'm a prophet too. And an angel just spoke to me and said, It's okay if you eat and drink with me. But God had already told him, Don't you do it. So what happens? He's sitting there, and this prophet actually becomes inspired at this point, and God speaks through him and says, You didn't listen to me. And because of that, guess what happens to this old fellow? He gets eaten by a lion. He gets killed by a lion right there on the spot. God means what he says, and he really only has to say it one time. And if you really believe God, you really love God, you're going to do what he tells you to do. It doesn't matter how good this other stuff sounds. That's what 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4 is about. Itching ears. Oh, boy. Man, my ears are really itching. I'm engaging in some constant unrepentant sin, and I want someone to make me feel good about it. Don't bother coming here. Because that's not our job, is it? Our job is to preach the truth, and hopefully... If you're engaging in something you ought not to do, you know what it ought to do? It ought to step on your toes. If everywhere you ever go, the only thing you ever hear is comfort and there is no warning, you need to go somewhere else. Notice a similar thought. Exodus 16, 4. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they walk in my law or no. What is the difference in whether they walk in my law or no, or whether they love me or not? What's the difference? There is none. Love for God is expressed in obedience to God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? Jesus said the same thing in red letters in John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, is that true or false? How about another one of those? 1 Corinthians 13, 5. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself right now. Do you biblically, do you love God? Are you doing what God has told you to do? Simple question, isn't it? If God is truly loved above all others, our actions will show it. Now let's talk about worship. God is the object of our worship. We're not here to worship each other, are we? We're not here to worship the Bible, are we? We're not here to worship grape juice and unleavened bread, are we? No, these are acts to engage in that actually glorify and worship God. 
That's who we're here to worship. God is the object of worship. In Exodus 34, beginning in verse 14, it says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the <laughs> Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. For thou shalt worship no other God. The implication is the only God you can worship is who now? Do you know that according to Colossians 3, in verse uh, 5 through 7, that covetousness is idolatry? Did you know that? Oh, there is no other God but God. Well, wait a minute. That's true, uh, purely speaking. But did you know that whatever you elevate above Jehovah is your God? It's your God. Money? Family? Everybody hear me okay? I'm trying to speak loud. I know there's a little noise in here. Okay. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship who now? Worship the Lord. He is our object. Nobody else. Nothing else. Not family. Not friends. Not loved ones, not money, not job. That doesn't mean that they're not important, does it? It simply means that God is who we worship. It's who we serve. God is the object of our worship, and he demands that worship be done in a certain manner. Now, that's fitting, isn't it? The one who, who is receiving our worship has prescribed that it can only be in a certain way. Did you know that? You know, I remember watching this TV show one time, and this so-called apostle said... He quoted 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17, and he quoted it poorly, and he made terrible application. You know what he said? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. That's what the last phrase said. And he says, see, the Spirit of the Lord's in here, and we can do whatever we want to. That's not what it means, is it? Everybody understands from just a couple of weeks ago that the context of 2 Corinthians 3 is a contrast between covenants. And the new covenant is a reference to the Spirit, and the old covenant is a reference to the letter. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty from the old law. And there's liberty from sin. Not liberty to do as you please. God has said that if you worship me, you're going to do it a certain way or else. We can do it in song, can't we? Ephesians 5.18. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. What's that last phrase say? Brother Lee, you can read that, can't you? To the Lord. What's that say again? What's that, first, what's that first word? Speaking to yourselves. We've done that, haven't we? We've done that today. When we're singing, what are we doing? We are using our mouth. We are speaking. We're not playing, are we? We're not playing, are we? We're speaking. We're singing. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, uh, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Here we go again. You want a little divine commentary on Ephesians 5.18? Look at Colossians 3.16. Singing. Singing with what now? You know what? We're supposed to have played an instrument today. Did you play yours? You know what that instrument is? Your heart. Did you? Were you twanging your heart when you were singing? Were those words echoing from your heart? If not, please... Make it a point to do so. That's how you're supposed to. You're supposed to hear the words. You're supposed to resonate in your mind, come down in the heart, then come out of the mouth, right? That's basically the way it's supposed to be. Singing with understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. We offer prayers to him. Matthew 6, 6. But when thou, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret. Who are we praying to? The Father. By whose authority are we praying? The Son. Anybody got an authority to pray directly to Jesus? No. Nope. You pray through Jesus to the Father. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, you're not going to ask me anything. You're going to ask him in my name, by my authority. That's how you pray. We pray to the Father, Matthew 6, 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. You know what is interesting to me about the folks that say you can't pray to Jesus? Why? When Jesus Christ told you to pray to his Father, why are you going to pray to him? Why don't you just do it the way Jesus said to do it? Isn't that easy? Why you got to be an innovator? We don't want innovators, do we? We want somebody who believes God and does what he says. That's simple, isn't it? What about this one? Do you pray without ceasing? Well, that, you know, I'll tell a little story about myself real quick. When I was a young man, I was pretty religious, uh, and I prayed all the time. Do you know that? That I would, I would just sit there like this in the car because I thought I'd done something wrong, and I would just, you know, I, I had a little bit of a misunderstanding, but I was very sincere about it. Mom still gets me a hard time about that sometimes. But you know, praying without ceasing doesn't mean that you have to spend 24 hours in prayer. What it means is it's consistently. 
You're doing it. You know, Daniel's a good example. Daniel, he prayed three times in the day. It didn't matter if the king said otherwise, did it? He's doing it. You're not going to stop him. That's what it means. Pray that way. That's the way we're supposed to, aren't we? When we do so, we trust that he will answer them. James 1, 6 and 7. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything. If you pray to the Lord, you better trust that he's going to deliver it if it's according to his will. God is the one that answers the prayers, right? When we pray to him, we have full trust and faith in him that he's going to answer us as long as what we ask is in accordance to his will. What about asking to have our sins forgiven? Is that in accordance to his will? Man, do you know how eager God is to forgive sin? Read Luke 15. I read that last night. The prodigal son came back to the father. Did the father, oh no, I'm not living in my house. Did he lock the door? He ran out to meet him. And he ran out there and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And he gave him all these blessings. What's the point? The point is, God is so incredibly eager to forgive, but he's only going to forgive on his terms. Right? If we pray to God, we better believe that he's going to answer. We glorify him by worshiping in spirit and truth. But the hour cometh the night is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him, four-letter word there. M-U-S-T. What's that mean? Obligation. No other way. Must. When Jesus said, except a man, uh, uh, except a man be born of water and spirit, that except in falls means there's no other way. Same concept here. Must. You must do it this way or there's, there's no other way. If you worship God, you must do so in spirit and in truth. Spirit, proper attitude, humble submissiveness to God. What happens if you're out living your own life, you go to the bar Saturday night, but you come and grace the pews on Sunday morning? Are you worshiping God in spirit? That's just absurd. You haven't submitted to him. You don't believe what he says about drinking alcohol. You don't believe that. What about in truth? His word. God's word is truth. John 17, 17. Therefore, if you're going to worship God acceptably, you're going to do so with a proper submissive attitude, and you're going to do so only in accordance to his revealed standard. That's it. And if you do so, we have assurance that our, accept, or our worship is what? Accepted. Our Lord and his sufferings are the focal point of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this, uh, eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, uh, where, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, wait a minute. We did it. What? 25 minutes ago. Did you do it worthily or unworthily? Yeah. Were you thinking about pizza? Were you thinking about lunch, football, baseball, basketball, golf? Or were you thinking about the Lord and his death, his suffering, his body, his blood? Unworthily, that's a pretty scary word. Isn't it? You better be careful. He is our object in that activity. God is the object of our trust. God is the object of our faith. God is the object of our love. And God is the object of our worship. Let us never lose sight of these facts. And let it ever be so. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here this morning that have never obeyed the gospel? If you've never obeyed the gospel according to the Bible, if you're of accountable age, you're going to suffer everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. That's not my opinion. That's 2 Thessalonians 1. Verses 8 and 9. That's the Lord's word. You can change that here this morning. Hear the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 8. It is the word of faith. Romans 10 17. Faith comes by hearing his word. You must believe this word. John 20, 30 and 31 says that John recorded all of these things so that you may believe and have life through Christ. You must repent of your sins. Why? Because the very word of faith tells you to do so in Acts 17 and verse 30 and in various other texts. What is repentance? Repentance is a change in mind, a change in will, and a change in actions. Confess Christ before men, Romans 10, 10. Be baptized for the remission of sins. In so doing, you're trusting in God to forgive you because he's the one that told you to do it. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Be thou faithful unto death, and we have a wonderful crown of life awaiting us. Revelation 2, 10. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you faithful right now? I've said it twice already. One more time. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith right now. If you're not, acknowledge those things to God. Ask him to forgive you. He will forgive you if you need the prayers of the church. We'll pray them for you. 
We're going to offer this invitation song. If you need to obey the gospel, come forward. We'll study with you. We'll baptize you in Christ. And if you need to come back to the Lord, we'll do that by helping you do so through prayer. The invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing. Kneel at the cross.